In today's episode, we go over some of the most gruesome tiger attacks on humans ever recorded. From a man who snuck into a tiger enclosure at the zoo, to a man-eating tiger in India who killed two people from the same family in less than 24 hours. These are some of the worst attacks you'll ever see. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Final Affliction. Zoo Boise in Idaho is home to an array of animals from around the world. Visitors can visit the zoo and view lions, penguins, giraffes, wild dogs, and Siberian tigers. These tigers are the largest of the big cats and, in the wild, are confined to the southeast of Russia and small areas in China and North Korea. With so few left in the wild, each and every individual, captive or wild, is important for the species. Zoo Boise was always popular for those visiting Idaho, and when they introduced two Amur tigers named Taiga and Tundra, their visitor numbers shot up by 25%. The tigers were brothers who came from Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago in 1999. They were popular exhibits at the wildlife park, but on Friday, August 16, 2000, their fate remained uncertain. The zoo was holding a fundraising event. Keeping a zoo going requires significant funds, and charity events are often a valuable source of money and potential investment. Aptly named the Feast with the Beast, the event drew in donations from far and wide. One visitor to the event was 41-year-old Jan Gold. After eating at the special sit-down meal, there was a chance to see some of the animals, and so some of the guests gathered by the doors to be taken on a brief tour. Just before 9 p.m., Jan Gold joined a small group of people for a behind-the-scenes tour of the tiger enclosure. Whilst a member of staff explained the importance of these incredible animals and the conservation efforts to save the few hundred left in the wild, somebody left a gate unlocked. It was a mistake that would change the course of the evening. A zookeeper enticed the two tigers closer to the indoor section of their enclosure. Fresh meat was used to lure the animals from their grassy outdoor area into their cages. From there, they could be observed up close. But one of the tigers had other ideas. It had seen the group of tourists inside the tiger house. It had locked its eyes onto the enthusiastic visitors and sniffed the air. As it followed the meat trail towards Jan and the others, it came across an unlocked gate. The latch hadn't been securely fastened. It nudged it with its nose. The gate swung open. Nobody noticed as the 600-pound, 270-kilogram cat stepped through onto the other side of the fencing. Its huge paws, 4 inches, 10 centimeters across, padded towards the open door of the tiger house. The largest Siberian tigers can grow to 3.7 meters, or 12 feet long, including a 1-meter, 3-foot tail. They are predators that usually stalk their prey before pouncing on them. Prey species include small mammals like rabbits and hares, as well as deer, wild boar, and even some bears. They are powerful and strong, pouncing on their prey and using their muscular forelimbs to hold on to an animal before sinking their teeth into the neck. The tigers stepped inside the tiger house. Those inside were unsuspecting and turned at the last second, coming face to face with the fearsome cat. Immediately, it pounced at the first person it saw, Jan Gold. She yelled out. Everybody else screamed as they saw the enormous tiger bring her down. They ran out of the tiger house in a blind panic, leaving Jan fighting for her life. The tiger's sharp claws dug into Jan's back, and she crumpled to the ground under its weight. Standing over her, the tiger opened its jaws and closed them around her head. Zoo manager David Wayne shouted at the animal, trying desperately to distract it, trying to get it off the woman, but the tiger had latched on and wasn't letting go. Amidst the laughter and music of the busy feast with a beast party, police sergeant Rich Schnebly heard something else. He strained his ears and looked towards the doors. Over the loud chatter of the charity event, he could hear blood-curdling screams. He began making his way through the crowd. 
pushing people aside as the screams grew louder. He had been attending the event on behalf of the policing community, but suddenly jumped into action when he heard the desperate cries. He made his way to the exit doors, following the sound of the calls for help. He didn't know what he would find, but he had his sidearm to hand and ran towards the tiger exhibit. Inside the tiger house he found Jan underneath the enormous tiger. He immediately reached for his holstered weapon and raised it in front of him. But another police officer had already drawn his weapon. In the commotion, it was impossible to make a clean shot. It was too dangerous to fire a round into the tiger as it tussled with Jan's body. There was a chance the bullet could hit her. Instead, the other police officer aimed the gun just above the tiger's head. He squeezed the trigger, firing two rounds from his 45 caliber pistol. Jan screamed and writhed around on the floor. One of the rounds had appeared to hit her, but the loud crack of the gunshots had the desired effect on the escaped animal. Taiga immediately jumped backwards and headed for his cage. Zoo manager David Wayne and Rich Schnebly ran towards Jan, but as they did so, Taiga spotted them out of the corner of his eye. He turned his head just as he was about to step inside his cage. He did a U-turn. His instincts were strong. He wasn't finished yet. He leapt back towards Jan and the two men who were just feet from where she lay. They stepped back when they saw the tiger coming towards them. Taiga's enormous frame towered above Jan once more. Without hesitating, the police officer fired another shot and the tiger ran back to his cage. This time, David and Rich rushed at the cage door. They pushed it hard and secured the lock. Luckily, this time, they were quick enough to close the gate behind him and he was safely secured. The two men knelt down beside Jan. She was badly mauled on the back of her neck and her head, but she was bleeding from the gunshot wound in her thigh as well. They administered first aid whilst waiting for the emergency service to arrive. Afterwards, the police department claimed that one of the bullets from the police officer's gun had ricocheted off the metal bars and struck her in the thigh. But upon examination of the gunshot wound, it seemed Jan had received a direct hit from the bullet. She was in a lot of pain and was rushed to St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center. When she arrived, she was in a serious condition. She had a broken leg from the weight of the tiger and puncture wounds to her neck and back. She also had the gunshot wound. Doctors managed to stabilize her and she went on to make a full recovery. Following the incident, the zoo manager was put on leave until they found the cause for the attack. As news of the incident spread, the zoo received hundreds of phone calls from worried members of the public begging for them not to destroy Taiga. He was a popular animal at the zoo and such a rare species whose role in education and conservation was hugely important. It was decided that Taiga would be spared. It was human error that had led to the attack. Somebody had failed to close the gate properly, and Taiga was only acting on instinct. It was a human error that could have cost somebody their life and that of a rare and endangered animal. Thirteen years later, Taiga was to meet his end. In the wild, tigers typically live 10 to 12 years, and in captivity, 12 to 18 years. At the age of 15, Taiga was suffering from renal failure and had large tumors along his spleen. He wasn't responding to veterinary treatment, and so it was with a heavy heart that the zoo staff decided it was best to put him to sleep. His brother, Tundra, died three years later at the age of 18. He had cancer of the liver and pancreas, but was considered old for a tiger. Over their years at the zoo, the brothers had become part of the zoo family. They had brought in a huge number of guests and had helped raise awareness of this endangered species. In 2007, the IUCN upgraded the Siberian tiger's status from critically endangered to endangered. In the 1940s, the Siberian tiger was on the brink of extinction with just 50 individuals left in the wild. Russia was the first to ban tiger hunting and restricted the hunting of its primary prey, too. Since then, their numbers have slowly crept upwards. With the hardworking conservation teams fighting to keep Siberian tigers alive, maybe there's hope for the species yet. 
Situated in India's southwestern region of Karnataka lies Nagarahole National Park. It is a wilderness stretching for 250 square miles and is covered in dense forests, streams, hills, valleys, and waterfalls. It is home to an abundance of wildlife, including samba and chital deer, Indian leopards and elephants, sloth bears, guar, and the Bengal tiger. Considered one of the biggest wild cats in the world, Bengal tigers can grow to more than 3 meters, 10 feet long, and weigh more than 200 kilograms. They are formidable predators. In this part of India, the tigers share some of their habitat with the locals. It's a dangerous existence for both species, and when tiger attacks occur, it sends shockwaves through the communities. In February 2023, this exactly happened when not one but three members of the same family died in quick succession. Chathan was 18 years old. He worked long hours in one of India's coffee plantations in Nanachi, an area that backs onto dense forest. It is situated in the region of Karnataka, which produces just over 70% of India's coffee. It is grown in the shadow of the mountains, producing one of the best tasting coffees in the world. But for the workers, there were risks working on the plantations. Not only did they work long, arduous hours, but there were risks from the likes of cobras in the long grass and tigers that stalked through the surrounding jungle. Plantation owners rarely paid compensation for injuries or sick leave. Workers were allowed an hour's break for lunch, but weren't given access to fresh water. They had to carry their water with them whilst working in the fields and relieve themselves in the fields. Work began at 8 a.m. and finished at 4.30 in the afternoon. Work was particularly challenging during the harvesting season between November and March. There was significant pressure from the plantation owners to pick all the coffee from the bushes before the season ended. But Chathan was used to this pressure now. Chathan belonged to the Chenukuruba tribe. Since the 1970s, the majority of the tribe have been evicted from their homes to make way for tiger conservation. They have been uprooted and relocated outside the reserves. Many of these people who used to farm their lands are now agricultural workers like Chathan, harvesting coffee to earn a living. Those in the community who do still farm are subjected to tiger attacks regularly. The tigers see their livestock as easy prey. Goats and sheep are regularly taken by the big cats who are on the hunt. The shepherds run, fearing for their lives, and often return later to find many of their flock injured or dead from the tiger attack. It is a difficult life living in the shadow of a tiger reserve. And whilst nuisance tigers are often tranquilized and relocated, the removal only makes room for another tiger to move into the territory. The problem is never resolved for long. Amongst the coffee shrubs, the lone tiger wandered through the cultivated rows. Oblivious to the imminent attack, Chathan continued to fill his blue plastic bucket with coffee beans. He reached up tall to grab each red bean before slinging it over his shoulder into the bucket that was slung across his back. And still the tiger kept moving forwards, inching ever closer to its unsuspecting prey. Its footsteps were delicate along the soft ground. It paused briefly, crouching down lower, when it heard the voice of another worker along one of the rows of trees. Then it continued its stealth-like approach. It was camouflaged in the shade of the trees. The dappled sunlight that settled on the plantation floor hid the tiger, whose body outline was broken up by the orange, white, and black of its fur. Not a rustle was heard not a snap of a twig. The tiger is a masterful hunter. When it was within a few yards of the young Chathan, it rushed forwards, its powerful front limbs thundering across the ground before it leapt out of Chathan's back. He was sent crashing to the ground, the wind knocked from his lungs, his blue bucket sent flying through the air. Moments later, there was a piercing bite to the back of his neck. The force was unimaginable. The warm, moist breath of the tiger could be felt just before it delivered its fatal blow. Chathan had only managed to let out a shocked cry when he was smacked suddenly from behind with the force of the immense tiger. 
In an instant, it closed its jaws around his neck, suffocating him in seconds. The attack was rapid. The calls from Chathan's co-workers spooked the tiger, and it left its prey and dashed off into the surrounding wilderness. Moments later, screams rang out across the plantation as Chathan's body was found lying motionless on the ground. It was clear he had succumbed to a tiger attack. Terrified workers scanned the lines of trees, their hearts thundering in their chests, knowing the tiger was still out there. As is often the case with Hindus, the body of a loved one must be cremated within 24 hours of their death. Upon hearing of Chathan's attack, his funeral was arranged and his family attended the cremation the next day. To lose a member of the family at such a young age brought unimaginable grief to the family. One of those family members was Chathan's grandfather, Raju. It was a deeply sad ceremony, and to say goodbye to a grandson was heartbreaking. But for the family, things were about to get worse. The following morning at 6.30 a.m. on February 13th, 75-year-old Raju stepped outside his home. He lived near the Hulakal anti-poaching camp close to Nanachi Gate of Nagaraholi Range. He was in tiger habitat. He knew the dangers of sharing his backyard with the big cats, but it was his home. He had made his livelihood there, and it was all he had ever known. It had only been hours since he had said goodbye to his grandson, but as he left the comfort of his own home that morning, he was being watched by a predator, a predator that had already tasted human blood just hours before. It was the same tiger that had killed Chathan, and now it was coming for Raju. The tiger had fled the plantation and the body of Chathan, but remained in the area and had now stumbled upon another potential food source. It was just yards away from the door, concealed by the undergrowth. It fixed its eyes on the older man, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. When Raju's back was turned, the tiger decided to pounce. It attacked from behind, using the element of surprise to take down its prey. Millions of years of instinct packed into a muscular and powerful body. Raju let out a groan as he was floored by the predator. Its sharp claws dug into his flesh as it clung onto him with its powerful paws. He tried to put up a fight, but was pinned face down in the dirt. The tiger had struck again, and Raju was dead in seconds. His body was found later that morning by his family. For a tiger to strike the same family twice within 12 hours of each other was incomprehensible. When news spread of Raju's demise, it was too much for 56-year-old Jayama to take. She was the third family member to lose her life, but this time it wasn't at the jaws of the tiger. It was from shock and grief. Nothing could bring the three of them back, but many believed that things could have been done differently. The forestry department responsible for maintaining the reserve were strongly criticized by the locals for not searching for the tiger immediately after Chathan's attack. If they had dealt with it then, then they could have saved one, potentially two more lives. In their defense, they claimed that the light was fading and that they planned to send a search party out the following day. But that was too late for Raju. 25 camera traps were set up to locate the tiger. Five elephants were used to search for it and more than 150 field workers combed the thick brush in search for the predator. One camera revealed a tiger lounging in a large concrete tube. It rolled on its back with its paws in the air, oblivious to the hunt that continued outside. The day after the attack on Raju, when the search was in full swing, Deputy Range Forest Officer Ron Jean spotted what he thought was the culprit. Skulking back in the coffee plantation where Chathan had lost his life was a tigress. She was old, around 12 years, and had been seen attacking cattle from nearby farms. Typically, tigers in the wild will live for 10 to 15 years. As they reach the end of their lives, they slow down and lose the ability to hunt. Livestock are much easier for tigers to hunt, humans even more so. The team that helped capture the tiger included six veterinarians. They tranquilized her, and when she stumbled to the ground, they lifted her onto the back of a jeep. 
and transported her to the Animal Conservation, Rescue, and Rehabilitation Center at Kugali. With the deadly man-eating tiger now removed from the wild, villagers in the area are hoping for a long break before another tiger takes someone else to their terrifying final affliction. Yungor Wildlife Park, also known as Ningbo Zoo, is situated in the Yingzhou district in eastern China. It is a relatively small wildlife park, but it offers the chance to get up close to more than 200 species of animals. It delivers fun for all the family, playgrounds and rides, the chance to see some of nature's greats. But in comparison to western zoos, this Chinese animal sanctuary simply doesn't match up. The animals are sometimes taunted into performing to the delight of the audience. The enclosures are small and dirty. The animals are malnourished and understimulated. Maybe it was a matter of time before an animal would lash out. Maybe the conditions in which they were kept was a disaster waiting to happen. In January 2017, tragedy was about to strike Ningbo Zoo. Mr. Zhang and his family planned a Sunday afternoon out at the zoo with their friends Mr. and Mrs. Li. As they walked towards the entrance, Mr. Zhang had an idea. He decided to try and cheat the system, to try and sneak his way into the zoo for free. As they walked along the tall walls on the zoo's border, he looked up, searching for a way in. His wife thought he was being silly and carried on heading towards the entrance gates. The entry fee was 130 yuan, about 18 US dollars. Although considered very cheap in comparison to Western zoos, it is expensive for Chinese zoos, with Beijing Zoo costing just 15 yuan per visitor, or 2 US dollars. While Mr. Zhang's wife and children entered the zoo with Mrs. Li through the main gates, he and Mr. Li scaled the perimeter wall. It was 3 meters, 10 feet high. But there was a tree next to one section of the wall. The two men leapt for a low-lying branch and pulled themselves upwards. They managed to reach the top of the wall and hovered there for a moment, looking for a way down. They would have to jump. Mr. Zhang went first. He crouched down then held onto the top of the wall as he lowered himself down. His legs were dangling five feet above the ground when he let go. He landed with a thud. He was in. Mr. Lee followed, dropping down into the zoo grounds. They congratulated each other on their achievement, but now stood another challenge in their way. It was another three-meter high wall. On the top were metal bars arched backwards. It was clearly built to keep people out or something in. Trapped between the outer perimeter wall and this inner wall, the men needed to climb once more. But before they did, they noticed warning signs pinned to the wall telling people not to enter. Despite these clear warning signs, the two men ignored them and looked for a way up the second wall. Mr. Lee decided to help Mr. Zhang up. As Mr. Zhang teetered on his friend's shoulders, he reached up to the iron bars on top of the wall. He managed to grab one. He pulled himself up and positioned himself between the bars before leaning back down to help Mr. Lee up. When they both made it to the top of the wall, they looked around. There, below them, was a tiger, and another one, and a third. Three tigers on the ground beneath the two men. They had scaled the wall of Ningbo Zoo's most lethal inhabitants. Upon seeing these deadly predators, Mr. Lee shook his head and began to climb back down the way he'd come. This had been a mistake. What had started as a bit of a challenge and a sense of deviousness had now turned into a dangerous situation. The two men were photographed on top of the wall by some of the zoo's visitors, both men in their blue jackets, peering into the enclosure, debating what to do. Before Mr. Lee slid back down, Mr. Zhang told him that he was going into the enclosure. He had come this far. There was no way he was going to turn back now. If he could just drop down into the tiger enclosure and climb the far wall, then he would be in the zoo, home and dry, and 130 yuan better off. Without hesitating further, he jumped into the enclosure. The tigers spotted him instantly and made their way over. Stepping over the long brown grass, walking past the trees and shrubs, they sniffed the air, their eyes locked onto the intruder. 
Mr. Zhang had assumed they were docile, semi-tame animals that would likely watch him from a distance or would run away. How wrong he was. As visitors who had paid their entrance fee looked out over the moat and into the tiger enclosure, they spotted the tigers heading towards a man in a blue jacket. This was not a zookeeper. This was a member of the public. They began to shout and scream. Terrified onlookers, some of them children, could see what was about to happen. One of the tigers launched itself at Mr. Jong and brought him crashing to the ground. It instinctively went for his head and neck, its long canines clamping down around his skull. The man's screams could be heard as he tried to fight back, but instinct was taking over the tiger. It may have been born and bred in captivity, but its killer instincts were still strong. Mr. Lee watched from the top of the wall, his heart in his mouth as he witnessed the tiger mauling his friend. There was nothing he could do, and he sure wasn't about to climb down into the tiger enclosure to try anything either. Mr. Jung could feel the powerful grip the tiger had on his head. His entire skull was inside the tiger's jaws. He was powerless to the enormous cat. He kicked and struggled. It was a desperate attempt to fight back. But with each passing minute, his struggles grew weaker. The tiger ripped the clothes from Mr. Zhang's body, his blue jacket laying strewn across the grass. The other two tigers circled the man, watching and waiting as the third held him tight in its jaws. The incident was captured on video by visitors to the zoo. The footage was circulated widely on China's social media platform, but it's too graphic to show. The attack lasted more than an hour as the tiger toyed with its victim, taking bites from him, dragging him through the grass and rolling him over. Every time Mr. Zhang tried to sit up, the tiger pushed him back down again. As the tiger readjusted its grip on Mr. Zhang's neck, blood poured from the gaping wounds. The tiger then grabbed hold of his foot and began dragging him towards some trees. Zookeepers had been alerted to the incident and armed police had been called to the scene. As Mr. Zhang's body became limp, the zoo staff fired firecrackers into the enclosure. The series of loud bangs sent the other two tigers running, scampering into the far reaches of the enclosure. But the tiger that was biting into Mr. Zhang didn't flinch. It continued to devour him. The staff grabbed a power hose and aimed it at the tiger. The water didn't distract the tiger at all. Instead, it began pulling and tugging at his lifeless body, dragging him across the ground through the long grass. A special unit of armed police arrived at the zoo and, under orders from the zoo staff, they opened fire on the tiger. It fell to the ground. It breathed its last breath and was silent. Mr. Jong's blood stained its muzzle. Saliva dripped from its mouth. Its eyes glazed over. With the remaining tigers secured in their indoor pens, emergency responders raced into the enclosure to rescue Mr. Zhang. He was unconscious at this point, but remarkably still alive. He was rushed to hospital where he was sadly pronounced dead a few hours later. What had begun as an enjoyable family outing had ended in tragedy. Not only had some children lost their father that day and a wife lost her husband, but a tiger also lost its life through someone's stupidity. Almost 97% of the world's tigers have been lost, and with less than 5,000 now left in the wild, the death of any individual tiger is a tragedy for the species. Mr. Zhang's relatives have called for the zoo to take full responsibility for the incident. They claim that the walls shouldn't be that easy for people to climb. They have insisted that more CCTV should be installed on the outer perimeter fence. If security at the wildlife park had been tighter, then Mr. Zhang may still be alive. One thing is for certain. You can take a tiger out of the wild, but you can't take the wild out of the tiger. Never assume a captive tiger is going to be friendly, or you might end up meeting your terrifying final affliction. The Zhao family had been looking forward to this all week. Bao and Mei were married for over five years, and a little over a year ago they welcomed their daughter into the world. Jia was the apple of her parents' eye, and the little girl shared the attention from her parents with her maternal grandparents. Mei's parents lived close by, 
And since her husband and father was often busy with work, May's mother, Ann, spent weekends with the couple. Ann and her granddaughter were inseparable, and May did not mind that her mother split her time equally between her own home and the Zhao family's apartment. She was such a great help with the little Jia, and went above and beyond to make the family's lives as easy as possible with cooking and keeping up with the housework while the young parents worked. So when they booked a family trip to the Beijing Zoo, May just automatically bought a ticket for her mother too. The grandmother was thrilled at the invitation. She'd never been to the iconic site either. The Beijing Zoo is one of the biggest in the world, housing an incredibly wide range of animals. Pandas, lions, elephants, wild African bucks, lizards, and the fan favorite, Monkey Hill, where there are over 100 rhesus monkeys swinging from the trees. You name it, the Beijing Zoo has it and they offer a unique experience where visitors can drive their cars through the many acres of land that hold these animals. The zoo does not believe in penning their animals in small and inhumane cages. Instead, they allow them as much freedom as they possibly can so that they can live their lives out as naturally as possible. The experience is as close to a real safari as you can get outside of Africa. So that morning, the Zhaos loaded their car full of snacks and drinks. However, May was slow to start. She'd woken up feeling a little nauseous, but she wasn't going to miss out on such an amazing family outing. And rescheduling the whole weekend would cost a lot of unnecessary money that the working family couldn't afford to waste. So May stayed at the back with her daughter for the first leg of the ride. After two hours, Bao parked the car in front of the ticket gates. He'd had a late night at work the night before, so May offered to drive them through the first half of the park while he kept her company in the passenger seat, with An taking over her place next to Jia, who was strapped safely into her car seat. May was feeling a little better than she did that morning, and she was sure she'd be fine to take over for most of the ride. Starting at the north entrance, they drove south, stopping first to see the reptile exhibit. Up next were the African animals. Lions, giraffes, and rhinos were all present. Just as their third hour in the park came to an end, they saw the tropical birds and the northern bears. That's around the time that little Gia nodded off. The toddler was long past her nap time, and she was most likely going to be out like a light for the rest of the ride. All in all, the morning had been an enjoyable one, but by noon, May was starting to feel ill again. The heat of the afternoon sun beat down on her, and she went from feeling slightly queasy to feeling downright faint with nausea. Just as they turned into the south wing of the park, entering the tiger enclosure, An noticed her daughter's pale complexion and encouraged her to switch places with Bao. They were past the halfway point by now, just where May agreed she would ride to. And even May had to admit that it was time to swap places with her husband before the dashboard became painted with the contents of her stomach. None of the occupants of the car had anything else on their minds other than making the change in drivers. It genuinely did not occur to them that they were in any danger at all. Up until this point, all of the animals had been behind sturdy fences or in cages. But in reality, the Tiger Exhibit and Monkey Hill were the two most popular attractions for a very specific reason. You could drive your car right into the wild animals' enclosures, with only the walls of your metallic vehicle around you for protection. All of the animals were fed on a strict schedule, so they were never hungry enough to pose a serious threat. And armored vehicles were parked with armed personnel inside every few meters or so as an extra precaution. None of the three adults in the car had even seen any stirrings of life in the exhibit just yet. They had driven only a few feet into it before Mel put the car into park. She released her safety belt, opened the door, and got out. Even the two Siberian tigers that were hidden in the trees were taken by surprise. Never in their entire lives of captivity had a human walked so freely amongst them. It was always just cars that drove past, and the zookeepers that threw their meat shares out of those big armored vehicles twice a day, where these animals ever saw any humans at all. 
Even though they were bred and raised in captivity and never once hunted a day in their lives, the moment they laid eyes on the walking, living creatures stepping out of the car, their primal instincts kicked in, and May was locked into the sights of their yellow eyes. She walked from the driver's side, around the front end of the car, toward the passenger side door. Bao's safety belt had gotten a little stuck and he was having trouble getting himself out of the harness. Annoyed, May reached the passenger side door and opened it for Bao, scolding him to hurry up as she did so. It was this sudden burst of noise from May that triggered one of the felines into action. Before now, he was too confused to decide how to react. But the sudden sound that came from the woman wiped all traces of thought from his mind. It turned into every ounce of the wild hunter that it was born to be. Racing out of the trees toward the woman's back, Bao saw the tiger first. He uttered a scream, and May turned to what he was looking at behind her, just in time to see the striped black and orange cat speeding toward her. It was so quick that May didn't have any time to react before the beast sank its teeth into her thigh. She did not immediately feel any pain, but she could feel the pressure of its jaws clamping down on her leg and hear the sickening sound of her flesh ripping to shreds between those razor-sharp teeth as it dragged her off her feet. The hunter didn't try to finish May off there. It was smart enough to start dragging her off to the safety of the trees. When it started pulling her, May finally felt the agonizing pain of her muscle being torn from the bone, screaming and flailing. Her struggles made no impact on the swiftly moving beast that had her in its grip. But Bao, suddenly free from his seatbelt, bound out of the car to the defense of his wife. On from the back seat, reacted in the same way. When she saw the tiger coming from the trees, she was no longer an old woman. Adrenaline and love drove her from the car, turning her into a woman 30 years younger. She ran after her son-in-law and her screaming daughter. Neither Bao nor An had any idea what they would do when they reached the predator. They only knew that they would fight with every ounce of their being to get Mei out of there. The tiger that had May in his jaws must have realized this, because he took one look at the pair running toward him and the armored car already speeding toward the tree line, and it knew that it was outnumbered. It unclenched its jaws, leaving May bleeding on the ground, and took off toward the depths of the trees. But the danger was far from over. A second tiger, a female, was hidden behind some bushes, but she had taken a little more time to assess the situation. She had mere seconds to react if she was going to get a kill away from this site before the men in the military vehicle made it the last few meters to the group. Once they arrived, the tiger's chances of a successful hunt went down to zero. The tiger leapt out of the bushes and landed right on top of the smallest and weakest member of the group, and that was the elderly Amon. Ba was already kneeling beside May, trying to hoist her over his shoulder, but he was having trouble lifting her, so he carried her in both arms instead. He was going to run as fast as he could to get her back to the car, and with May already screaming in his ears, he didn't hear or see the attack on his mother-in-law behind him. An was driven into the ground by the 300-pound animal. The tiger went straight for the jugular, sinking its teeth into An's neck, shoulder, and face. An did not even get the opportunity to yell out. The force that clamped onto her completely crushed her airways and neck and rendered her ability to push air past her vocal cords obsolete. The female tiger saw that the personnel carrier had come to a stop and half a dozen men carrying firearms rushed out. She heaved the struggling woman toward the trees, but her teeth tore right through An's neck, essentially yanking the older woman free. Bao turned carrying May in his arms, ready to sprint to their family car, but he stopped short. There were at least six men holding weapons running towards them. His mother-in-law lay on the ground. The severed artery in her neck was spouting blood out of her like a fountain, and the orangey blur that was the female tiger shot back into the trees like lightning. The men took May from Bao's arms and loaded on onto a stretcher. An was no longer moving, and even Bao knew that there was nothing anyone could do. She just bled out so fast that she was dead before they even got her into the back of the personnel car beside her injured daughter. Bao followed them in his own car, his daughter still strapped into her car seat, where she had slept 
through the entire ordeal. Fast forward eight months later, and May had endured several surgeries. A funeral was held for An. Bao and May still had nightmares, and baby Jia had grown like a weed. But the horrific events of that day, so many months ago, were far from over, because the Zhao family filed a lawsuit against the Beijing Zoo. That first year of recovery and the lawsuit now upon them. The Zhao family were drawn into an incredibly drawn-out lawsuit. It's been almost seven years, and it's still not completely come to an end. The courts did eventually decide that the zoo had sufficient warning signs set up, and that their armed personnel's quick response was the reason that the entire family did not die on that horrible day. But the Beijing Zoo still had a lot to answer for. In the three years that preceded the death of An and the permanent disability that May now has to live with, there were two other deadly attacks at the zoo. Both were staff members, and one of the deaths occurred in the very tiger enclosure where An lost her life. The tiger responsible for An's tragic death at Beijing Zoo Park was not euthanized by the zoo. Instead, it remained in an enhanced enclosure away from the public to prevent any other park visitors from meeting their terrifying final affliction. Tigers are one of the scariest animals in the world. Whilst their stripy orange and black coat might make them look beautiful and soft to the touch, these big cats are one creature that you definitely don't want to get up close and personal with. Sadly, sometimes people don't have a choice in the matter, especially when the tiger decides to attack you first. Officially the largest wild cat in the world, tigers are one of nature's most beautiful and wondrous creatures. Able to grow up to the weight of 360 kilograms, these big cats could easily pounce and hold a person down, as if it is the easiest thing in the world to do. Usually, even though they are carnivores, tigers will eat things such as deer, wild pigs, antelope, buffalo, and other large mammals. Like most animals, it is generally scared of humans, and if one is about to come across its path, the tiger will simply run away and hide so as not to get into any trouble. However, as always, there are exceptions to this rule, where the animal will either attack a human out of fear, disease, or because it is an opportunistic hunter who will try and go for the easiest meal that it can find. Sadly, for the man in this story, he was on the receiving end of one of these attacks. Hashmat Ali had lived in his small village in a rural area of Bangladesh his entire life. But despite living in the village for over 40 years, he is not someone who likes to get out amongst the other villagers and be sociable with them. In fact, for the last 20 years, Ali has lived as a virtual hermit after he was shunned by the village for something that happened to him many years ago. It was 1995, and Ali had recently turned 18 years old. Being a young man now, it was up to him to provide for himself and his family in any way that he could. Living in such a rural village with very few ways to actually earn money, Ali turned to the one job that quite a lot of people in his village turned to. He became a fisherman and a forager. It was hard work for Ali, however. Because he was young, he was able to recover quickly from the physical strain of the work. Because of this, he was often picked to do the harder jobs during his work. However, Ali did not mind as long as he was able to provide for himself and his family. Even though Ali would do whatever was asked of him, there were still some jobs that he enjoyed far less than others. One of those jobs was collecting honey. It was an incredibly difficult job, as the bees would be relentless in their attacks once they knew that their hive was being disturbed which meant that Ali was often left with quite a few nasty stings. Still, as long as he was able to get money from his foraging and fishing, then he was happy to do the work. Nevertheless, things would soon change. It had started off as a normal day for Ali. He had woken up and headed straight to work. He had been told by his boss that it would be a busy few days for them and that they needed to get onto the river and fishing as quickly as possible so that they could make more money. The first day had gone well. Ali was even able to find some honey, which he could easily sell. However, it was during the night when things took a turn for the worst. Ali had settled down in the boat. 
exhausted from a long, hard day at work. Only he had no clue that he was being watched from the shadows. Two glowing eyes stared at Ali, watching to make sure that the young man had fallen asleep and that he had no clue about what was going to happen. As the man slept, a large tiger stealthily slipped into the river and made a beeline for the boat that Ali was sleeping in. As quiet as a ninja, the tiger got close to the side of the boat before making its attack. In one moment, Ali was fast asleep, worried about nothing, and then, in a matter of seconds, he felt an immense pain, like nothing he had ever felt before, coming from his face. It was only after a few seconds had passed that Ali was able to fully realize what had just happened to him. His face had been slashed by a tiger's knife-like claws. The claws of a tiger usually grow up to 10 centimeters, or 4 inches in length, and they are used to grasp and hold on to prey so that it doesn't escape. After realizing what was going on, Ali let out a muffled, pain-filled scream. He was terrified of the tiger and of the thought that if he didn't get help, then the animal's next attack could possibly be fatal. However, the man found that his face was so painful to try and move that even trying to make the slightest of sounds almost made him pass out from the pain. It was in that moment, as the young man clutched his bleeding face, that Ali knew something terrible had happened to him, and that if he didn't get help soon, then it could possibly be too late for him. Upon hearing some strange noises coming from the boat, some of Ali's co-workers went to investigate what was happening. When they saw the tiger, though, they were horrified. The scene that they had come across looked like it could have come straight out of a horror film. There was blood everywhere, and Ali was holding his face where all of the blood seemed to be coming from. In that moment, the tiger grabbed Ali by the back of his clothes and proceeded to try and drag him out of the boat and into the river below. Feeling the animal trying to move him, Ali felt an overwhelming amount of terror seize him. The young man wasn't ready to die, but he was in so much pain that he couldn't find it within himself to try and fight the tiger's hold on him. Luckily, the rest of the crew understood what the tiger was trying to do, and they began to scare it off by creating as much noise as possible. Their plan worked, and the tiger ran off into the night. But the ordeal wasn't over yet. Ali had been seriously injured, and he needed medical attention right away. The young man's co-workers immediately made their way to the nearest hospital, where Ali was able to be treated properly. Thankfully, the doctors were able to save Ali's life. However, the teenager had been left with serious scars. The tiger's attack had left the man missing a large portion of his face. It seemed as if the animal's claws had ripped straight through Ali's face, leaving him needing extensive reconstruction work to his face. Heartbroken at this news, Ali knew that his life had been changed forever. Over the next 20 years or so, Ali kept himself hidden away in his home as much as he could. The man worried that if he was seen out and about, he would be ridiculed for how he looked, and his family would also be bullied because of him. He especially worried that his daughters wouldn't be able to find husbands because of how he looked. When Ali had to go out of the house, he would always wear a cloth over his face so that he wasn't constantly stared at and so that he didn't scare the local children. But within the last few years, Ali has been able to save up his money so that he could get plastic surgery to try and reconstruct his face so that it looked a bit more like how it used to look. Thankfully, the surgeries all went incredibly well, and he is now happy with how he looks and is not afraid to show his face to the world anymore, which is all he had ever wanted since that fateful day on the river. Now he has more confidence in his and his family's future. Even though the tiger attacked Ali, it wasn't acting maliciously. It was simply following its natural instinct to hunt easy prey. Sometimes, that just so happens to be a person in the tiger's eyes. In this case, Ali. Despite his face being ripped apart and shredded, he is lucky to have escaped what was almost certainly meant to be his terrifying final affliction.